then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul. And if you wonder what heaven might look like when we get there, I think that's a, a small glimpse, amen? I think that's a small glimpse of us bowing before the throne, bringing worship to our Savior, amen? Nehemiah chapter number eight, if you've got a copy of God's word, I want to invite you to turn to Nehemiah chapter eight. Our children are being released for children's worship again, we, we do ask second grade and down. If you're older than in the second grade, we want you to stay and, and be a part of our worship and here's this morning. Uh, but as you're turning to Nehemiah, we, we do want to talk a little bit about something that we, we want to make sure never gets forgotten. Uh, there are many people in this room today who are not alive. Uh, September 11th, 2001, amen. Uh, and there were a lot of people that, that, that lost their life that day and our world changed in a dramatic way and and, and I think as we approach the anniversary of September 11th, that it is a good time to pray for those families, amen, uh, because that sting is still there, I can assure you, and, uh, and I'm grateful for those that stepped up in a time of, of national chaos and, and served our country and, and went to fight for our freedom as a result of that, but, but we want to pray especially for those families uh, Lord, that, that, that this is a time that, that brings up some really hard, hard memories. Uh, and so we want to do that. But I also want to encourage you this morning, we're going to have a time of prayer, and, and we want to pray specifically for the Bradley family. Uh, Coach Bradley lost his father a few days ago, and so we want to lift them up. And then we also want to lift up the McClaney family as well, as we've, we've lost Brother Ricky. And so we want to pray for them. Uh, both of those funerals will take place on Tuesday. Uh, Brother Ricky's funeral will be here. Uh, and we would love for you to come and to, uh, to encourage that family. But we want to pray for those two families specifically. And then uh, Miss Gamble also, uh, she passed away yesterday. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of sorrow. Amen. So let's, let's lift up these families and, and let's remember those that, that uh, uh, lost family members on September 11th as well. God, we are coming before you, Lord, knowing and recognizing that 
Uh, there are many that are brokenhearted today, and uh, Lord, in the days to come, it's, it's going to remind so many of, of that brokenness and that loss that, that they've experienced, God. And so I pray for uh, those families that were forever changed on September 11th, God. And Lord, we just continue to, to lift them up, uh, Lord, and, and continue to pray for them. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, as, as we see, Lord, the, the, the battle between darkness and light, God. Lord, we see the wickedness around us, Lord, and it should just be a, an utter reminder, Lord, that the gospel needs to go forth and people need to hear the truth and, Lord, people need to be changed and, and people need to be saved, God. And I pray that we as a church, Lord, would, would take that challenge head on, Lord, and that we would, would be on the front line sharing the gospel and telling people about your love and, and who you are, God. Lord, we pray specifically for the, the Bradley families this morning. Lord, I pray as, as they mourn the loss of, of, of a father and grandfather and brother. Lord, I pray that you'd minister to them. A husband, Lord, help them and encourage them as, as they uh, cope with a new reality, God. I just pray that you'd comfort them uh, in the days to come. Lord, I pray for the McClaney family, God. I pray that you would minister to them. Uh, Lord, and, and I pray that, that you would uphold them, Lord, that you'd strengthen them with, with your spirit, Lord. And I pray, Lord, in both of these services on Tuesday, Lord, that you'd be magnified. Lord, I pray that you'd be lifted up. We rejoice knowing uh, that both Mr. Jeff and, and Brother Ricky, Lord, we know, we, we believe wholeheartedly that they are in your presence this morning, God, and we rejoice because of that, Lord. That's all because of you, Lord, and, and all because of what Jesus did on the cross, Lord, and I thank you for that. And Lord, so I pray that you would just minister to those families today. Lord, to the Gamble family as well, God, I pray that you would encourage them as well. God, I pray as we open up your word this morning, God, that you would be magnified, that you'd be glorified, Lord, and that our hearts would be directed to you. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Nehemiah chapter number eight, a church ready to be used, part number two. Last week we began, we've been walking through the book of Nehemiah together. And last week, we began to look at some indicators that proved that the people in Jerusalem were ready to see God move. They were ready for God to work in their midst. And as they, uh, were, were, they were ready to be committed to the Lord. And as we get to chapter 8, what we see are some more of these same type of indicators. And, and from these indicators, we're able to see some necessary components that that our church need to exhibit in order for us to be an effective, soul-winning, Bible-believing church. We, we see some things here in chapter 8 that we ought to look to emulate, things that we ought to look to model, components that, that I would remind you again that truly start with the individual heart. They start in our individual hearts and then they grow throughout our church, components that when applied, I believe can lead to spiritual revival. We talked about the need for revival last week in our own lives. We talked about the need for revival in our church, the need for revival in our community and in our, in our world. Uh, and, and so that's what we need. We need this spiritual renewal. And, and I don't know about you this morning, but, but every day that I wake up, man, I, I need some spiritual renewal. Amen. I need that every single day that I get up. I need a fresh touch from the Lord every single day. And he is faithful, amen? God is faithful to provide that if we'll look for it, amen? If we'll crave it, if we'll desire it. Uh, and, and so we see this spiritual refocus taking place in Jerusalem. And, and so last week I presented this statement to you. A church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom relevant ways is made up of individuals who are committed to. And then we start to fill in the blanks from things that we found in chapter 7 and we're going to fill in the blanks from things that we find here in chapter 8. And so we said that this church that is ready to be used by God from last week is a church that's committed to a daily public profession and practice of their identity in Christ. We're not ashamed to be followers of Christ and we're going to live it every day, amen? That, that's a church that's ready to be used. A church that's ready to be used is made up of individuals who are committed to a passion for biblically principled purity, to, to live a life of holiness. That's a church that God is ready to use. When it's got people that are made up that, that take holiness seriously, God's going to use that church. And then lastly, we said that the, God is going to use a church who's made up of individuals who are committed to participate monetarily. 
We saw all of that from chapter 7 last week. And today, I want us to think on that same statement as we dig into chapter 8. And, and, and I know for many of you, if you were here with us a few weeks ago, you're going like, man, this seems a lot like the message we heard a couple weeks ago when you preached out of Psalm chapter 19 about the wonderful words of life when you highlighted Scripture and you looked at the Word of God. Because guess what? We're going to talk about the Word of God again today. Amen? We're going to talk about the value that we get out of God's word and, and, and the importance of it. And we see that here in Nehemiah chapter 8. And so I want to ask you to stand with me. It's a long chapter. I'm going to read all of it. Uh, and, and there's some names in it that are, that are challenging. And so I'm going to probably guess. I'm just going to tell you. And give it my best shot. And if you want to pronounce it some other way, go for it. So Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him at his right hand stood Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Urijah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And at his left hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebijah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Jozebad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and to rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in the courtyards or in the courts of the house of God and in the open square in the water gate and the open square of the gate of Ephraim. The whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. And there was a very great gladness. Also day by day... <clears throat> From the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a, a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. God, we are grateful for this attention that we, we see that was given to your word. We're grateful for this response that we see that was made from the hearing of your word. And God, I pray today as we dig into your word. Lord, I pray that we'd pay great attention to it. God, I pray that we would respond to it. God, I pray that we'd live by it. God, encourage us through your word today. Lord, challenge us through your word today. Equip us through your word today. Make us more like you today through your word. God, we love you and we praise you. And we ask you to move 
Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, what a blessing it is, Lord. But I pray today that people don't hear from me, Lord. I pray that they hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom-relevant ways is made up of individuals who are, number one, unified in their hunger for the word. A church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom-relevant ways is made up of individuals, that's me, that's you, that's all of us who are unified in our hunger for the Word of God. Verse 1, I think, of, of this chapter might be one of the best examples in all of Scripture of a unified people. It's incredible. Did, did you notice what it said? It said in verse 1, all the people were gathered together as one man. That, my friends, is, is really hard to fathom. It's even harder, I believe, to achieve. Uh, it's incredible that this is where they were. We're all here, Nehemiah, Ezra. We're, we're all here. We're, we're ready to hear from God. We're, we're all gathered together as one man. But, but can I tell you today that it wasn't just a, a unified spirit of heart that was going to lead to revival in Jerusalem. It didn't matter that they were all there as one man. What mattered is that they were all there as one man for one purpose, for one reason. They could have been unified on so many other fronts. There's so many other things that they could have been there for. They could have been there unified to get rid of Nehemiah, to get rid of Ezra, to reject God. Now, that would have had zero effect on their spiritual growth. Adrian Rogers once said, he said, it is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. You get that? We can be united in error. He goes on, he says, it is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. You see, unity in and of itself, that's not the goal. Being together is not the main goal. Yeah, we are looking for unity with God. That's the unity that we desire, with God that, that, that then goes on and breeds unity with one another. And the way that we attain that is through God's word. That's how this unity with God and then unity together takes place as we find it in the word of God. And the people in Jerusalem, what we find is they were unified in their hunger to hear God's word. They come together and in unison almost call on Ezra, bring the book of the law and read it to us, Ezra. We want to hear God's word. I've said it many times, but I believe that one of the greatest downfalls of the, the Western church especially is that we take for granted the free access that we have to God's word. I believe this is one of the greatest challenges in our church today. We, we have multiple, how, how many of you, I've probably asked you this before, but how many of you have more than one copy of God's word at home? Almost all of us, right? How many of you have the Bible app or something on your phone where you can pull it up on your phone and read the Bible? <coughs> we have access to God's word, and yet, and yet, we possibly access it less than those who have less access. And you have to understand, for these people in Jerusalem, they had just left a situation a few generations earlier where they didn't have the access that they once were used to, that they once were accustomed to. And you, you understand that they had to come back and they had to rebuild the temple and they had to rebuild the walls and now it's time to rebuild their hearts. And they, what do they do? They understand that the primary way Nehemiah understood, Ezra understood, the primary way that a revival is going to happen in Jerusalem is we must focus our lives around the word of God. We must be centered on God's word. For, for the people of Jerusalem, that, that phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder, that's where they were in re regards to Scripture. They were ready. They were ready to get back involved. But for us, I think that our access has created a mindset of complacency. I believe it's created some, 
some apathy, and I would even say that it has created neglect to God's word as a church. I think we must be very careful with this. But they wanted this ability to come together and hear the word of God. They, they, they were hungry for it. And so the question that I think we need to ask ourselves individually this morning, and remember, we're talking about individuals, me, myself, and I, how hungry for God's word am I? How much do I crave and do I yearn the word of God in my life? And I think that the greatest uh, tool of assessment that we have to look at this is just we, to start with our own individual devotional life. How much are you getting into God's word individually on a regular basis? How often are you studying and reading God's word on your own? In other words, are you having a private time with the Lord day in and day out where you read and meditate on God's word? Uh, another way that we can assess our personal hunger for the word of God is by how much we avail ourselves to the teaching of the word of God. Because if I would say that if we only want to come and hear God's word taught two times a month, there's an issue. There is an issue there that where the hunger is not evident. Clearly, if two times a month of hearing the teaching of God's word is enough for us, then our hunger for the word of God isn't where it needs to be. If we would prioritize such as other things, such as our entertainment, such as our, our hobbies, such as sleep or, or any of these other things, if, if we would prioritize that over getting plugged into to small group Bible study, there's an issue. 1 Peter chapter 2 Verses 2 and 3 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may what? That you may grow thereby. If indeed, this, this next verse is so critical to this, I believe. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. I, I just want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you tasted the grace of God in your life? If you have tasted God's graciousness, then Peter says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word so that you don't stay like you were, so that you don't stay a newborn babe, so that you grow in your walk with Jesus. That's the church that God's going to use is the church that is hungering for the word, that is craving the word, that is growing in the word. God implores us to crave the word of God, to desire it, not, not just to read it, not just to, to, to check that box to say, okay, on Monday, I read my Bible on Monday. Not just to, to feel better about ourselves spiritually, not to, okay, I, I'm going to give myself a spiritual pat on the back because I read the Bible today. Go me. No. No. To grow because you've, you've already tasted a glimpse of God's goodness. You, you've tasted the glory of God. And, and guess what? When you've tasted something great, what do you want? You want some more of it, amen? Listen, I, I have tasted the goodness and glory of ribeye steak, medium Ribeye steak, 145 degrees with a little bit of pink in the middle of it. And if that makes you sick, you can just send me your pink steak and I'll eat it. I've tasted the goodness of it. And you know what? It brings me back. Amen? It brings me back to the table next week when, when I, I get that steak off the grill. And the, hopefully the week after that too. The word of God. We've tasted it. We've tasted God's goodness and, and it ought to bring us back and we ought to desire it day after day after day. Peter says that if we've tasted the Lord's graciousness, if you have been saved, if you have been changed by the word of God, then the Bible says our desire for that ought to continue. We ought to continue in that desire uh, so that we may grow closer to Jesus and more like Jesus. But the problem 
is that, that as, a, as a people, we, we get saved, we taste the graciousness and the goodness of God, and we say, praise God, I'm not going to hell. Praise God, when I die, I'm going to heaven. I got all I need. I'm set. And so now I'm going to focus on this and I'm going to focus on that because I've got my get out of hell free card. I don't need to grow anymore. I'm, I'm where I'm at and I'm good with that. We got too many churches that are full of people that are satisfied with just being saved. Satisfied with just being saved. Now, that is a glorious thing to know that you're saved, amen? But God has so much more for us than to just be saved. I mean, that's incredible to think about, by the way. But there's so much more that he has provided for us that he wants for us to enjoy and to, and, and to experience than just salvation. The, 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 the scope of salvation is so much greater than just missing hell and getting to go to heaven. There's so much more to it than that. He wants us to grow in him, to be closer to him, to be more like him. We should never, ever feel like I've got enough. We should never, ever feel like I've made it as a Christian. I'm as far as I need to go. I don't need to grow anymore. I'm where I want to be. I heard a preacher say one time, he says, I don't read my Bible because I have to. I read my Bible because I know I need it. Because I need to read it. Because I know how empty I am without it. I need the word of God in my life. God's people should desire to read and study God's word as often as we can. We should want to be in a small group. We should, whether that be Sunday school, whether that be Wednesday night Bible study. We should desire to come to church to feed on the word. People say, I don't go to church because... I just don't get much out of it. And, and I would even submit and say, you know what? I can see where you're coming from. Maybe the, and this is not the case here, but, but maybe, the, maybe the worship service is dead. Maybe the, maybe the preacher, and this might be the case here, maybe the preacher is a little bit boring and monotone and, 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 and you know what? I just, I don't, I don't really hear much from him. And that all might be true. But can I tell you this morning that if the word of God is read or spoken in any way, shape, or form, it's worth your time. It's worth your time. Because God's word is what works. It's not my voice. It's not the leadership of our praise team. It's the Lord. His spoken word is what we need. We, we should want to come to church, if nothing else, than to hear God's word proclaimed. We, we should want to open our Bible daily and feed on his goodness of his revelation to us. But here's what happens. Our, our hunger for the word is all too often stamped out by our hunger for the things of this world. You see, we, we, we don't hunger the word of God. We don't have an appetite for the word of God because our appetite is being filled with everything else around us. We're, we're being satisfied by the things of the flesh and when that happens, guess what happens? We hinder, we hinder the move of the spirit not only in our own lives but we hinder the move of the spirit in the life of our church. Every single per if every single person in our church body, in not just our church, in the church, would hunger for the word of God the way that we read these people did, the way that they called on Ezra says, hey, we're here, come read God's word to us. We just want to hear God's word. If we would have that kind of hunger together, I promise you revival would take place. Revival would happen. If we were seeking God's word that great, revival would happen. If we, if we would sell out to, to study and to grow in God's word, revival would happen. And God will use the church. 
that is unified in its hunger for the Word of God. So, so First Baptist Church, Florida, I, I've got a challenge for me and for you. Let's get serious both individually and corporately about feeding on the Word of God. Let's get serious about that. Let's make that a priority in our life day in and day out because I believe we will. God will be ready to use us. And God can use us. Number two, a church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom relevant ways is made up of individuals who are undivided in their commitment to the word. Not only do we see the people call on Ezra to, to read the word, we, we see how focused they were when he started reading. Look, look back in verse 3. It says, Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Most scholars look at morning until midday and say that was about six hours. And I know most of you right now are like, is he about done? <laughs> is he almost finished? Because I'm hungry. Six hours. They came together and listened to the proclamation of God's word. They just listened as Ezra stood and he proclaimed it. And as we'll see in a few minutes, some people around him helped explain it so that they could understand. But I think this gets even more convicting as we read on. Look, look continue to look in verse 3. It says, before the men and women and those who could understand. Now, I'm going to stop right there for just a second. I know there were some questions, you know, why? Why? Why are we back in children's church all the way down to second grade and below? And shouldn't those third, fourth, and fifth graders, shouldn't they be able to go to children's worship as well? I'm just going to tell you that in Ezra's day, these people that could understand stayed in there and heard the word of God. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. Third, fourth, and fifth graders can understand the word of God. They can understand it. And they can worship. Uh, they, they can go to school and they can sit for seven and a half hours in a classroom. And they can learn how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and do all those things. If we're doing our job and we're explaining the word of God like they were here, then they can understand it. They need to be in here with you, with their parents, with their grandparents. But anyway, let's, let's read on. That was just a side note. It says, and those who can understand, and the ears of all the people were what? They were attentive. Now, that tells me that, that, that Ezra got there at the, in the morning and they started reading the word and it says he read it until midday and it says that all the people that were there, all the men and the women and everybody could understand, their ears were attentive. You know what that means? That the whole time that Ezra was reading God's word, nobody fell asleep. Nobody took a nap. And remember, they started in the morning, right? When you're drowsy and you're groggy and you hadn't got going yet in the day, I'm, I'm not a morning person. I'll submit to you that. And no, nobody was sitting there with a church bulletin saying, I'm going to draw and doodle and make this little picture and he'll be done sooner or later and then we can go home. Uh, nobody got on their phones and said, oh, let, me check. let me check the weather. Let me, let me check Facebook. I, I wonder what's happened in the last hour since I haven't checked Facebook while I'm at church. Uh, today, the NFL season gets started in earnest and if, if you're like me, I, I got to check and make sure my my fantasy football team roster, make sure all my players are playing today, that none of them are injured, none of them are sick, they're in the lineup. No, they weren't doing any of that. No, they were focused. They were focused on the word of God as it was being presented to them. No, nobody was, was twiddling their thumbs in boredom. Everyone was glued to the word of God. We, we talked about September 11th a while ago. I can remember... When, when those events took place and we're watching the news on TV, our eyes were glued, not, not just for a few hours, but for days. Watching the news and paying, we were attentive to, to what was going on around us. These people were glued to every word that was coming out of Ezra's mouth. They wanted to understand the word of God. They wanted to hear it. And, and, and verse 13, uh, now on the set, notice this. If we skip down to verse 13, it says, on the second day, ha, 
It wasn't just one day they came to hear the word of God. They came back for more. They wanted more of it. Did it all over again, but, but, but notice what it says. On the second day, the heads of the father's houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites were gathered to Ezra the scribe in order to understand. They weren't just hungry to hear the word of God. They wanted to know the word of God. Amen? How about us? Do we want to know and do we want to understand God's word? In verse 7, we see that, that God put teachers in place to help them, to help them understand the word. And, and this magnifies to me the importance of being in church. For, for that crowd that says, I can have church on my own, I can have church at the lake, I can have church on the golf course, I can have church in the deer stand, but you don't have these teachers in those places to help us to understand the word of God. We need that. The people of God, or the people of Jerusalem, were 100% present in this time that the word of God was being read and they wanted to grow and understand the word. That This wasn't just about going to hear the word spoken. This was about going to store the word in their hearts so that they might not sin against God so that they don't. Now listen, they had just rebuilt the temple. They had just rebuilt the walls. And the last thing they wanted to do was end up back in Babylon because they were disobeying the Lord. And so they wanted to be focused on God's word to make sure that they didn't make that mistake again. They wanted to comprehend the very heart of God. And so here's the question. When we read God's word, when we sit under preaching and teaching of God's word, whether it's good or not, how present are we in those moments? How engaged are we? When, when we're, not just when you come to preaching and teaching, but, but when you're spending personal time in God's word. How engaged are you to that time? I, I, I've been guilty of this so many times when it's, it's time to open up the Bible and, and I'm going to read today and I'm going to look into it. There have been a lot of times when I've not been engaged because I'm, I'm worried about this or I'm worried about that or I've got this to do or I've got that to do and I need to hurry through this to check the box. Am I rushing through it to, to say that I did it? Do, do, I, do, I, do I actually pray over what I'm reading or preparing to read? Do I actually meditate on it after I read it or do I, once I read the sentence and hit the period, do I close my Bible and move on and not to think about it again the rest of the day? Am I digging deeper into what I read? When you come to church, are you coming to church for the purpose to, to hear the word, to study the word, to grow in the word, and to worship Christ? Are you coming to be seen? Are you coming because it's what's expected? Are you coming out of obligation? Church, if while we're here, and if, if while we read and study God's word on our own, in our own homes, in our own time, if we'll be fully invested in that, God will move through it. God will work in your life through that. Not only God will God work in your life, but God will work in the life of this church if we will be fully attentive to the reading and to the study of God's word each time we get in it. Well, let's take our time in the word of God seriously, forsaking it for nothing. Let's not forsake it for anything. Number three, a church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom relevant ways is made up of individuals who are unassuming in their reverence to the word. Unassuming in their reverence to the word. Look at verse five. In verse five, I believe we can see why they were both hungry for the word of God while they were also completely attentive to the word of God. It, it says that when Ezra opened the word, all the people stood up. Now, I do want to say this is partly why we, when we read God's word, we stand. It is, a, it is a respect thing. I will say that this is not prescriptive. This is not something that the Bible commands us to do. It's not something we have to do. We don't have to stand when the Bible is read. But what we see is they did it because they had such a reverence for the word of God in that moment. Verse 6, it says that they bowed their heads and they worshiped their Lord with their faces to the ground. What we see 
is that these people had a humble reverence for the mere reading of the word of God. They're, they're standing and then the, the subsequent bowing of their heads was simply a sign of respect. I respect God and I respect his word. They respected it because they recognized it as the word of God. They respected it as 100% from him, not the words of man. And, and so when we look at the respect that they had for the word, I think we need to ask ourselves, how reverent am I to the word of God? And this goes way, 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 way beyond just standing up when we read it. How reverent am I to the word of God? Number one, do, do I recognize it as the inspired word of God, meaning that God divinely inspired each and every author to write exactly what was put down? Now, I understand you get into translation and we start to wonder, are we, is it completely accurate? And we, we, get into, we can go down a whole rabbit trail there. But do you believe that God divinely inspired Scripture? Do, do, do you believe that the Bible is both inerrant and infallible, meaning is it without error? Is the Bible true? Is it authoritative? Is it trustworthy? Do you believe that today? Do you believe the Bible cover to cover without exception? Say, like, well, this part sounds good, but, but I'm not so sure about this or I'm not so sure about that. I, I don't know if that, that measures up. If we're going to revere the word of God and if we're going to honor it for what it is and if we're going to be able to receive in our hearts as truth, then guess what's required? Humility. We need humility. James chapter 1, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. And here it is. Receive with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Receive God's word humbly. We, we don't have to understand completely how God uh, revealed his word and how he inspired this word to the writers of it. I, I, that, that's really beyond me how God did that. It's incredible, quite frankly. But we must humbly trust in complete faith that he did. You know why? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says he did. And so in faith, humbly, I have to take that, man, this is the inspired word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's breathed out by God. You, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. This is how you accept it holy, you accept, or humbly. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And if, if, if you can't take Peter's word for it and you can't take Paul's word for it, let's take Jesus' word for it. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's God's word. And church, for, for God to move among us and through us, we must humbly and faithfully receive the word of God as his word, uh, authoritative and, and prescriptive, and, and we should follow it in our lives. Number four, a church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom-relevant ways is made up of individuals who are unashamed in their response to the word unashamed in our response to the word. We, we clearly see they honored the reading of God's word, but, but more important than that, we see they responded to God's word in a positive way because you can respond negatively as well, by the way, but they responded positively to the reading and teaching of God's word and they weren't one bit ashamed of their response 
And we see, as we read this, we see some very public responses. Verse 6, look at verse 6. It says, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered. So here's the response. Amen. Amen. Amen, Ezra. That's God's word. And we agree. That, that, that amen, amen, verily, all it means is verily, verily, or truly, truly. Yes, that's the truth. That's the truth, Ezra. That's the word of God. This was a proclamation of agreement that this was God's word. And they were on board. The people of Jerusalem were on board. Then we see it says they, they lifted their hands. They, they bowed their heads. They're, and that's just, they're, they're praying and they're, they're worshiping God as the Bible is being proclaimed. Now, their Bible was not the full Bible that we have today. We understand that. It was the, the book of the law. But they're worshiping as they hear God's word. They're, they're bowing their heads. We see in verse 7, we've already made mention of this, that how the teachers were helping them to, to understand what it all meant. They're hearing it. They're gaining understanding. And, and do you know what their next response was? They began to weep. They began to, to mourn as they, they heard the word. We, we, we see that in verse 9. As they began to understand the word of God, in that moment, they understood as a people how they had neglected it in their life. And when they realized just how much they had neglected the word of God in their life, tears began to flow down their face. They understood in that moment, that they as a people, when they heard the word of God, that they were guilty of sin. And that's what God's word does, amen? It reveals to us who we are. It reveals to us our depravity, but it doesn't stop there. It reveals to us a savior. It reveals to us a, a remedy for that sinfulness in our lives. But what the point I want to make here is they were not ashamed. They, they heard the word, they understood the word, and they weren't ashamed to respond to the word openly, publicly, in front of every. Remember, this was everybody, men, women, everybody could understand, and they're weeping in front of other people. One of the reasons that I believe churches struggle to be effective for the kingdom is we struggle to be transparent with one another. We, we struggle to be open in our response to who God is. We, we internalize everything, and this is, this is for me, myself, and I don't want anybody to see me weep. I don't want to confess or, or admit to anybody that, that I am a, a sinner, that I am flawed, that I make mistakes, that I blow it. I put on this face, this mask, and I walk around like everything in my life is perfect and I'm this great Christian and, and there's nothing going on in my life that would bring up question for anybody. But the people of Jerusalem, when they heard a word of God, man, they abandoned all of those things. And they said, we're going to openly respond we're going to let God's word work in our lives and we're not going to hold back. And, and I think for many of us, and, and I would definitely say myself included, we've often heard the word without, without properly responding to the word. One of the, the greatest instruction that I've, I've gained from some, some of my teachers and mentors and, and, and preacher friends alike when it comes to preaching is to make sure that before you ever preach a message that you allow that message to have impact in your own life. That, that, that you allow the Lord to work in your heart through that. And y'all, I'm going to tell you, there are days when, when, when I preach something and next day I've moved on 
I've moved on to preparing for the, the next message, right? I, I get into that routine of preparation, preparation, preparation. We need to meditate on it, amen, so that we can rightly respond to it. We see in verse 14 through 17 that they recognized that, that they were to be celebrating the feast of the tabernacles. And, and, and so what did they do in verse 15 through 17? They responded and prepared to do just that. The, the point is this. They not only heard the word, but they responded to the word. And that's what we need to do. God doesn't want us just to read the word. God doesn't want us just to, to hear the spoken word. God wants us to respond to the word, to grow thereby, amen? To grow through the word, to be changed by the word. James chapter 1, we already read verse 21. Verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not, for, not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. How do we respond to the word of God in our life? Do you read it? Do you hear it? And then the next day forget about it? I would... I'd, I'd love to take an anonymous poll. I wouldn't want to put you on the spot. But if I hadn't have told you what I preached about last week, how many of you would have remembered that? you probably already forgotten now, right? That, that was, man, that's been 45 minutes ago. How do you expect me to remember that? <laughs> it's true. And you know what we'll say? I just don't have good memory. That, that's, that's my favorite excuse for me. I, just, I struggle memorizing things and, and I can't remember things. It, but I'm going to tell you what it really is. It's usually because we, we weren't really paying attention. Remember how attentive they were to the word? The reason we don't remember is because we're not attentive to it. Or we don't think about it anymore when we leave. So we, we give you the bulletins that, that have the outline in it where you can interact and you can write that down and it's got the prayer prompts. And I'm going to just tell you what the intention behind that is. It's not so that you'll have something to take notes on. It's so that you'll have something that you can take home with you Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and you can review and you can meditate on and you can continue to think on, this is what I heard this week. Am I applying this in my life? life. We can't be doers of the word if we let the word go in one ear and out the other without it ever making it to our heart. And to get it to our hearts, you've got to commit yourself to it daily. Daily. Churches are stagnant and dry because they are full of people who simply do not respond to the word of God in their lives. Too many people are worried about how the world will view them living under biblical holiness. Be, too many people are worried about how the world will respond to us standing in biblical truth. Too many people are worried about people being offended by the gospel message. Can I just tell you, the gospel is offensive. It tells us who we really are. And I'm just going to tell you, that, that don't make me feel real good about myself, amen? But it also tells me who Jesus is, and that changes the whole story. See, the people of Jerusalem weren't ashamed of responding to the word, and we shouldn't be either. If we want God to revive us, if we want God to use us. Lastly, number five, I'm almost done. A church that is ready to be used by God in kingdom-relevant ways is made up of individuals who are unburdened or unshackled, if you want to use that word, by the joy and peace from the word. I pointed out just a moment ago how in verse 9 the people responded with mourning and weeping. We see true brokenness over their sin. This was 
uh, a great response that, that we see them make. And, and when we read God's word, it ought to elicit that same type of response. There ought to be brokenness and, and, and we ought to have a desire to repent of our sin. We, we should take sin just as seriously as God has taken our sin. The, the Bible tells us that God hates sin. We too should hate sin. But too often when we talk about hating sin, it's, it's a lot easier to hate somebody else's sin than it is to hate our own sin. But we see these people, they were weeping over their own sin. They were penitent over their own sin. But I love what we see next. The, the word has <coughs> a reproving, corrective nature. That's what it does. That's what the word of God does. It reproves, it corrects. And when it reproves and corrects, you know what that, 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 that feels like? It's painful. It's painful when the word is working in our hearts sometimes, amen? It hurts. But these people were reminded. Look what Ezra tells them in verse 9. This day is holy to the Lord. You need to stop you're mourning and you're weeping. Go your way, verse 10. Eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing because this is a day of celebration. <laughs> you, you, yes, you've recognized your sin, you see your brokenness, but today's a day to celebrate because the joy of the Lord is our strength, amen? Amen. Because the, the Lord's word has revealed to us our sin. It has led us to repentance of our sin. It's led us to correct the sin in our lives and it's given us the means to do so. Do so. Ezra's telling the people to rejoice because God had provided a way out from their sin. You don't, church, gotta tell you, you don't have to mourn over your sin today because Jesus has already bore it on the cross. You don't have to live in shame you don't have to live burdened because Jesus has taken that shame and carried that burden on himself. Ezra's telling him, says, you need to rejoice today because God has delivered us from Babylon. You need to rejoice today because God has restored Jerusalem. We have the temple, we have the walls, and he's working to restore our hearts. Praise God today for us that while we should certainly be sorry for our sin and we should be humbled by our own sinfulness to the point of repentance, God wants us to rejoice today because we have been freed from the bondage of our sin. And that is something to have joy about today. Let's weep over that, amen? That's a different kind of weeping. Those are tears of joy. Man, if, if we had a church full Myself, I, listen, I'm hard. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I've got a hard exterior. And for me to cry, uh, it takes a little bit. But man, if we could just be overcome by the emotion that we've been saved, that we've been redeemed, and that we don't have to carry that weight of sin in our lives anymore, that ought to bring us to tears, Amen. God wants us to rejoice this morning in his grace and in his mercy that he's bestowed upon us. One, one commentator wrote it this way, our knowledge of our sin should never be bigger than our knowledge of Jesus as our Savior. We are great sinners. Would you agree to that? How many of you say amen to that? We are great sinners. That's not the end of his statement though. But he is a greater Savior. That's what we got, amen? That, that, that's who loves us. That's who this word speaks of. God doesn't want us to live chained to our sins because he's already delivered us from our sins. He doesn't want us living in guilt and shame. No, he wants us living in the glory and the power of his son, Jesus Christ. He didn't just come to give us life. He came to give us abundant life, and he came to give us abundant life, not just in eternity, but right now. 
Now, he didn't save us for us to continue to wallow in our sins, amen? He saved us from our sin. And praise God today for the joy of the Lord that is my strength. It's the realization that I have been wondrously, gloriously, graciously saved from everything that is me. It's that realization that can get me through anything in life to know that I've been rescued, to know that I have hope, to know that I have a Savior who loves me beyond compare. Through the reading of God's word, the people here in Jerusalem were in the very presence of God and it's in the presence of God that gave them joy in the midst of their realization of their sin because they responded rightly to their sin. Church, you will not experience the joy of the Lord and the strength of the Lord until you rightly deal with the sin in your life. You want the joy of the Lord in your life, you need to deal with the sin. And how do you do that? You trust in Jesus. You trust in Jesus. He's the one that dealt with your sin. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. I ask you today, do you, do you need some protection? Are the fiery darts raining down on you today and, and you need a shield to protect you? It's found here. Every word of God is pure and he is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Today is your heart broken over some sin in your life. Today, I believe that if that's the case, if, if there's some brokenness over your sin, if there's some, some weeping and mourning that's taking place in your heart over some sin in your life, today I believe God has shown you the path of life, and that path is Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you, you need to call on him right now to forgive you of your sin, to save you from God's wrath on sin, which only Jesus can do. As, as he is the one that took God's wrath upon himself on the cross for you, for me. We talked about responding to the word. Now's the time to respond. You need to respond to the truth of God's word that you're a sinner in need of salvation and that Jesus came to save you and he wants to save you. You just got to surrender. Respond through surrender. Submit to him as Lord. And today, if, if you are saved, and, and as we've gone through this message, if you find yourself, you say, you know, Brother Chris, I, I'm not as hungry for the word of God like I know I need to be. That, that, that appetite's been suppressed by this or by that. I, I'm not committed. I'm not as committed to hearing the teaching of the word of God like I ought to be. It's not as important in my life as I know it should be as much as I recognize today how much I need it. I've not been revering the word of God the way that I should be. I've not been responding to the word of God the way that it's calling me to. And I've not, or I've not been living in the joy provided through the word like we see today. Now's your time to respond. Today, God is saying, respond. Today, God is saying, you know what? You, today, you can have a renewed hunger for the word of God. Today, you can have a new focus on the Word of God. Today, you can have a new reverence for the Word of God. Today, you can respond to the Word of God. If you're here, if you're living and breathing, God has an opportunity for you to respond to His Word. And you need to respond. We always should respond. There should always be a response when we get into God's Word. Amen? This altar is a great place to begin that response. Now, I, I know we, we don't want to walk down in front of people and we don't want 
people to think less of us. If they see us walk down to the altar, they're going to start questioning what's wrong with so-and-so, and then they're going to get on the phone after church, and did you see so-and-so go down to the altar? Do you know anything about what's going on in their life? Did they do this? Did they do that? What's going on? I, we, we like to gossip. We want to do all that. And that's what keeps us from coming to the altar. But the people in Jerusalem, they didn't care about any of that. Because let me tell you something, they had blinders on and they were focused on the Lord. We need to put some blinders on right now and we need to, in this moment, we need to focus on the Lord. God, how, how do you want me to respond to your word? God, how, 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 how do you want me to pursue your word? How much do you want me to hunger for your word? Okay, God, I hear you. I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond today. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this great example that we have of a people who hungered for it, who focused on it, most of all, who responded to it. And Lord, what we, we see that once they responded, you responded. When, once they had a, a hunger and a thirst for it, you showed up. And then through Ezra, you, you reminded them that their, their joy was in you. God, if we would respond to your word today, Lord, we could be reminded of that same joy. God, I pray that we as a, as a people would have a newfound hunger for your word, that we would study it, that we would read it. Lord, that we would be taught in it. Lord, that we would prioritize it in our lives because when we do that, <clears throat> we know that you can use us. God, when we do it as individuals, God, we know that when we come together that you can use us as a church. God, I, my, my prayer for our church is that we be a Bible-believing, Bible-functioning church. Lord, we got to be committed to it. Help us, Lord. Help each of us. Lord, I, I pray if there's someone here today that needs to respond to your call to salvation, Lord, they recognize, just as the people in Jerusalem did, that, that, that there was sin in their lives that, that they needed to repent of. Lord, it led them to weeping and mourning and, and maybe there's somebody here today that, that's weeping in their lostness. Lord, they recognize that there is a hole that they've tried to fill with this or fill with that. But maybe today they can see today that that hole can only be filled by Jesus. So God, I pray that they'd call on him in this moment for salvation. That they would put their trust in him and depend on him, Lord. For whatever else your people in this place are dealing with this morning. God, I pray that this would be a time that they could call on you and seek your face. God, move as you see fit today in Jesus' name.